this scripture is from Acts. It's Acts 9, 36 through 43, and it's on the screens as well. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. Sorry. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated means Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand, and he helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Before I begin, I want to just say a couple of things. Um, we have, for the moms who are here today, uh, some carnations. And uh, at the end of the service, the ushers will be handing them out. Um, and if we don't have enough, uh, I'm sorry, we, we, it's always uh, uh, tough to gauge that. We also have a special gift for our moms here. And if you don't get one of these today... Um, make sure we know and we'll make sure we get some more. So hopefully uh, they're first come, first serve for today, but then we'll get some more. Uh, it's it's uh, just our way of saying thank you for that. Uh, second of all, I want to say this, that uh, we're talking about serving today. And it seems very appropriate that, um, that uh, one of the people being remembered uh, in our service today is Gary Engler. Uh, because he was our deacon emeritus, and uh, he, uh, for many of us, was a great example of what it is to be a disciple. A disciple is not just an honorary position, it is one who really goes out and serves the community. And so uh, we think of Gary today as we think about service. And, and the last one is a personal note. Um, some of you have heard and seen that I was surprised this week they named me the Chamber of Commerce Citizen of the Year, and I was totally, totally taken by surprise uh, and very humbled and very honored by that. Uh, Dorothy made sure to put a big thing in the bulletin, and uh, uh, I was a little embarrassed by that, but I, I'm thankful. If, if you did want to come to that dinner, there's information there uh, about that on June 22nd. But again, I, I look at it as an extension of our ministry, and uh, I've always felt that my calling is to, is to model what we're all called to do as we seek to make the community we live in a better place by serving the Lord. And so, again, I'm humbled and honored and glad to represent this congregation in receiving that award. So today I want to talk about Dorcas. Dorcas. You know, Lori and I were attending the First Baptist Church of Westwood, Massachusetts. The first time I remember hearing that name, Dorcas, because they had a women's group that was called the Dorcas Society. And so, you know, being inquisitive and being a seminarian, I thought, well, I should know who Dorcas is. And so I looked it up, and there it was in the Bible. It was the first time I came face to face with one of the real heroes of Scripture. Dorcas is one of those people in Scripture with multiple names. Even in our Scripture reading, they call her Tabitha, and it says that's the Jewish name, but the Greek name was Dorcas. And so people have adapted either Tabitha or Dorcas as the names that they call this one woman. And like with many Jewish names, they also take that name and it has another meaning. And that meaning is the gazelle. Now, could you imagine being nicknamed the gazelle what, and what that would uh, do for you? Well, a gazelle, the reason that was there is because gazelles have beautiful eyes and they are swift to move. 
And so when you think about Dorcas, you think about what they say about her in this scripture passage, you know that she was one incredible, special lady. And all of this seems to fit Dorcas. She's described as a woman who is everywhere, always reaching out, always helping, always serving. And the scholars suggest that she was a widow because they don't mention a husband anywhere. Maybe that's why she was so keenly aware of the needs uh, that the other women had, especially those who did not have a, a husband to support them, which was almost necessary to survive in that day. She had a heart to serve. She was the woman, even though it often is used in terms of married women, but she's a woman who's described in Proverbs 31. And hear these words. It says, and these are uh, some of the paraphrase of Proverbs 31. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for the task. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's clothed with strength and dignity, and she can laugh at the days to come. The scholars say that this was a perfect description of Tabitha Dorcas. She also reveled in Jeremiah's call to seek the peace and prosperity of the city in which you live. The prophet says, pray to the Lord for it, the city, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And so it seemed like everybody knew her name because she was out there and she was being a blessing. So when she got sick, everyone seemed to notice the whole town seemed to be in an uproar. And when she died, they were deeply moved. We've all known people like that who touched our lives and the lives of our community in such a way that their loss was tremendous. Now Dorcas lived in Joppa, which is a town about 35 miles northwest of Jerusalem. It's a seaport town. It's the same town that Solomon used to bring in the timbers of Lebanon to build the great temple. It was on the crossroads of, of the world, it seemed like, and everybody was coming and going through there. Word reached the town that the apostle Peter wasn't far away. He was in this town, Lydda. And so the people reached out, hoping for some kind of a miracle, hoping for some word of consolation. And so they sent for him and said, come quickly. And Peter responded. I wonder if the people he was with in Lydda had heard of Dorcas. And maybe that's why they said, go, go, they need you over there. Now, I can't tell you if Peter knew about Dorcas before that day. But I can tell you he was certainly moved by the stories and testimonies of the women he met on the way to the place where they laid her. The women were weeping, and as Peter came by, they showed him the many robes and pieces of clothing that she made for them and shared the tales of her generosity and love. It reminds me almost of the day when Jesus stood outside the, the tomb of Lazarus and the greatest, most powerful verse of Scripture is there where it says Jesus wept. And you get the same sense as you read this passage that Peter was so moved by what he was hearing from these women who were known and loved by Dorcas. There was no doubt that, that when he got down on his knees, he prayed with all his heart. If you're a mom, there's no doubt in my mind that you spend time on your knees. That's what you do when you care. You pray, you ask for God's protection, or in times of need, you ask for His intervention. And prayer is a powerful gift that God gives us. It's like a power pack that gives us new strength and allows us to face whatever challenge we have. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in time of trouble... When the world seems to be falling apart, prayer is that gift that brings in the presence of Christ into our lives that gives us the strength to go forward. So Peter stoops down, grabs hold of this gift of prayer, and in the next instant, he brings Tabitha, Dorcas, back to life. It's a miracle. Wouldn't you know it? Dorcas starts serving, starts right away in serving again. You know, there's something about 
serving that is very noble, when you're doing things for others, when you are putting others' needs out there as part of your journey. Some people see it as beneath them. I remember when I joined my college fraternity, one of the things they said to us was that when you ask a brother or when you ask a a pledge, someone who's joining the fraternity to do something, you should never ask them to do something that you would not do yourself. And I've always thought throughout my life and my ministry that that's true. That when I ask someone to do something, I should be willing to do it as well. I remember years ago we were putting a ramp in at the First Baptist Church in Norwich. And George Resendiz will remember that because he did all the hard work. (coughs) Drilling holes and all of that. But before they were doing it, I tried to take my turn too. And that's when they asked me to step aside. but, But at least I tried. Of course, you and I know people who when we ask them to serve or to do something, they give us this feeling that that's beneath them. And that's a shame. Because the truth is, is that in serving others, it is the greatest of all blessings. I don't know if you saw today's Westerly Sun, but on the front page is a picture of Mabel Payne. Fifty years of serving as a nurse. What a wonderful thing. Mabel deserves a clap. In her work, she has ministered to generations of people, answering that calling, and that's what nursing is. It's like teaching. It's a calling to serve others. And there's something special about it. Even on your worst day, there is something that comes back to you when you're able to reflect When talking about greatness, Jesus said this. He says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers or leaders of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. And he's talking to his disciples, to the followers. He says, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. You know, I think that's probably why the guys get in the kitchen and cook up these meals like last night. They weren't doing it so that everybody would pat them on the back. They did it because they wanted to do something to serve the women in the church. And to say thank you for all you do in my family, in our family, and in the community serving. Several years ago, I read a book by Pastor Steve Shogren. It was called The Conspiracy of Kindness. And Shogren states that while less than 10% of Christians believe they have the spiritual gift of evangelism. You know what? I used to think evangelism was standing on a street corner passing out tracts. And one time we went on a mission trip to New York City, and we were down uh, by the boardwalk uh, by Coney Island, and, and we thought it would be a great ministry down there. We were told that we were going to serve meals to the homeless, but the first part of that day was walking the board rock, handing out tracks. <laughs> now, maybe you're good at that, walking up to a stranger and saying, here's a tract. Do you know about Jesus? Well, well again, Shogren said that only about 10% of us as Christians feel comfortable or willing to do that, because that's what we think evangelism is. But he said 90% of Christians believe that they have the gift of serving, that they can help, they can do something for someone else. And Shogren built a ministry on that concept of service, servant evangelism. His church in Cincinnati became involved in in this servant evangelism, and instead of just standing on street corners and passing out tracts, They washed cars for people who were coming by. They shined shoes. They grilled hot dogs in the park, all for free. It was part of their ministry and and part of the giving of the church so that they could be out there as, as giving for the sake of Christ. No strings attached. No, here, have a hot dog come to church next Sunday. What they found was they began to stand out from so many who seemed to be looking only for their own welfare. People couldn't believe that anyone would do something nice for someone else 
for a stranger without wanting something in return. And, and they really, they counseled the members of the church, don't do anything, don't do anything that would make them think the only reason you're doing it is to get them to come to church. When somebody asks you why you're doing it, it says, because God loves me and God did something like this for me. What they revealed, when they revealed they were doing this out of their love for Jesus, people responded to them by saying, you know, that's the kind of community that I want to belong to, a community that truly cares about others. Jesus is quite clear when he says that his followers are called to serve. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That means everything we do, we need to do to the glory of God. Not so that we'll get recognition, but so that God gets recognition. Because people will say, why are you being so nice? And you can say, because God was so good to me. That's the kind of testimony we need to share as the body of Christ in the world. Jesus understood that the way to win people's hearts is not through dominance or through preaching at them or quoting scripture but through loving them. When you care about people, when you're willing to put them first, it changes them, and this is the way Jesus believed we were going to change the world. Think about it. The very fact that Jesus loved us so much, the very fact that Jesus loved you so much, the very fact that Jesus loved me so much that he was willing to die for us, touched our hearts. It changed my life. I know it changed your life too. It changed Jennifer's life. She shared. It was the type of love for God that prompted Dorcas into a lifetime of serving others. And she got it. And God loved her. And she shared that love with others. You know, the truth is, is that we don't have a record of anything Dorcas said. She never wrote an epistle. It's not even quoted in the scripture. Oh, she was such a good Christian. You should see. She quoted scripture left and right. And she was always preaching to the others. No. The love that her friends expressed at her death says it all. Her life of servanthood spoke loudly. Another thing. And this is important. She is described as a disciple in the text. It says there was a disciple named Tabitha or Dorcas in the Greek. In fact, she's the only woman in the New Testament who is explicitly identified as a disciple. She stood out as a very faithful follower of Christ. She was so devoted that the only thing that is used to define her is the word disciple. A disciple in that time and today is described as one who is determined to be like his or her teacher. Jesus said a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. One of the highest compliments that someone could ever pay you as a Christian is to say, you know, I see Jesus in you. And that could be said of Dorcas. The truth is that a lot of people know the Bible. They know what it says and can quote it. And they often do. Yet not everyone lives the gospel. Dorcas was one of those people who did, and that's why she's remembered. She was described as a doer of deeds. The needs of people not only moved her heart, but in turn moved her to do something to meet those needs. She served out of her love of God. That was her identity. Like a gazelle, she was quick to respond when someone was in need. And when she looked in your eyes, all you saw was beautiful. Paul says in Galatians 6.10, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those in the household of faith. And what she did is what made her beloved and beautiful. It was her fruit of compassion. There's an old story told about a Union nurse in the Civil War who, who was in a fire and her face was badly scarred. And she would serve the soldiers who were wounded there in the hospital. When asked why she volunteered to work 
among so much death and carnage? She replied, because here among the wounded soldiers, they don't notice my scars as much as the others. To them, I'm beautiful. The truth is that when you give of yourself unselfishly, people see Christ in you, and that makes you beautiful. Now, one last thing. I want to go back to that throwaway verse in our text. You know, sometimes we have to read the text two, three, four times before we see everything. And I've noted that before. And so the text says this, All the widows stood around him, Peter, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with him. You know, in that day, there were no J.C. Pennies, no Coles, no coupons. Everything had to be made. When it says that Dorcas made all these things that not only included the outer garments, but the undergarments, it literally means that she covered them head to toe. When she brought the robes and the undergarments and that now you had a wardrobe that you could wear out, it was all because of Dorcas. She sewed these and liberally distributed them to the ladies. Dorcas had made everything they were wearing. They were literally clothed in her compassion, clothed in her love, clothed in her devotion to Christ. You know, you and I have been touched by people like that, right? Maybe we don't have the clothes that they gave us. Well, the Lord bought me this tie, and I, I kind of like it. You'll have to look at it later. But the truth is, our lives have been clothed by the compassion and love and caring of others, and it's made such a difference. We don't hear what happens after Peter raised Dorcas from the dead, yet I'm convinced that when she regained her strength, she returned to her quiet and unassuming service. How do I know this? Because miracles always magnify God and always work to spread the good news of His glory. The story ends with these words. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. The salvation of so many in Joppa, in a way, was actually the greater miracle than raising of the dead. You see, serving will break through disbelief, and a helping hand can often soften the hardened heart. And God is calling each and every one of us to get up and be involved in acts of compassion and love done in the name of Jesus. When I was on that radio program with John Gagne this week, he said, I don't know what the hope of the world is, and I missed my opportunity. Because I should have said in that moment, the hope of the world is the church of Jesus Christ. If there's any hope for the end of dissension and anger and war, it's if the body of Christ gets out there and begins to love people like Jesus did. Not to accept everything, but to love people and slowly bring them to an understanding that God's love changes all. God is calling us to get up and to go out. Now, none of us can do it all, but every one of us can do something. And so I encourage you today to do the something that God has put on your heart. Be like Dorcas. Go out and serve the Lord. Amen. We're going to close our service today by sharing uh, number 593 as our closing hymn. It is